Good morning. This is the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, we are, the date is, you know what day it is. It's Wednesday, the 9th of February, uh, 2022. We're taking up S-254, a bill and act relating to creating a private right of action against law enforcement officers for violating rights established under Vermont law. And uh, our first witness today is uh, Joe um, Demita. Joe, did I get that messed up? Yeah, Damiata, it was, it was close. Damiata, thank you, Joe. I apologize. Um, from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Thank you, Joe, for being here. We wanted to cover what impact a bill like S-254 might have on your um, member towns in terms of insurance and other factors. And maybe you could start with the lay of the land today and what, it's, sure. what you do and sure. how yeah. you condemn them. Yeah, ha happy, happy to do that. Um, good morning, everyone. For, for the record, uh, Joe Damiata, I'm the Director of Risk Management Services at the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. I also have our General Counsel, Phil Woodward, joining me today, and Phil will help answer any questions uh, that you may have at the end. As Director of Risk Management Services, I oversee the operations of VLCT's two member-owned and governed risk pools, the VLCT Property and Casualty Intermunicipal Fund, also known as PASIF, in the VLCT Employment Resource and Benefits Trust, which is an unemployment insurance program. Today, I'll be speaking on behalf of, behalf of VLCT PASIF, and that's spelled P-A-C-I-F. I'll be referring to, uh, you know, throughout this testimony and as, as to VLCT PASIF. As you've heard from VLCT staff members Karen Horn and Trevor Whipple in their testimony on January 20th, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns has joined 12 organizations in opposition of the effort to create a private right of action against law enforcement officers and eliminate qualified immunity as proposed in S-254. VLCT Passive also joins that list and will be opposing this bill as well for, for the following reasons. Um, the Passive program was established by VLCT members in 1986. It's 100% member owned and funded by Vermont municipalities. Our board of directors, is comprised of 13 elected and appointed municipal officials from around the state. VLCT Passive provides property, casualty, and workers' compensation coverage to 354 municipal entities. So that's cities, towns, villages, special purpose districts across Vermont. Uh, that equates to around 95% of the eligible entities in the state participate in our program. Included in those numbers are 53 police departments, and 552 police officers that are covered by our program. The city of Burlington and the city of South Burlington's currently do not participate in our program. In 2022, PASIF will be collecting $25.3 million in total annual contributions, also known as premiums in the insurance world, from our members. Of the 25.3 million collected, 1.1 million of that is for law enforcement liability contribution, which is what this bill is about. And 3.4 million is for workers' compensation coverage for police officers. And I only say that because I wanted to give you the average cost of insuring a police officer, which is around $8,100 annually per officer um, and through our program. The costs I just provided do not include the premiums for personal liability coverage that many police unions are starting to negotiate through the CBA process. Um, annual premium estimates for those policies that we've seen based on Colorado are ranging between $350 and $1,000 per officer annually. The cost of the policy for those personal liability policies obviously vary by state legislation such as S-254 and the type of coverage and limits provided by those policies. Insuring police officers is a significant expense and we feel this bill will only add to those costs over time. Um, as you've heard throughout testimony, the law enforcement profession is facing a staffing crisis. Morale's at an all time low and more officers are leaving the per profession than new officers coming in. Um, the effort in S-254 in our opinion will serve to exacerbate the difficulty that police officers have in filling vacancies, retaining officers and providing law enforcement services across the state. And a particular concern is understaffed police departments that lead obviously to a host of concerns, such as you know, officers that are tired from working too many hours and slow response times. Now, as you know, fatigued officers that work a lot of overtime 
um, will likely uh, lead to poor decisions or could lead to poor decisions from being fatigued, but also um, officer injuries, you know, more, the more time they spend on the job, uh, obviously the more fatigued they are, which leads to more injuries and more easily to hurt themselves. It's a serious problem facing law enforcement and one we should all be concerned about. I also wanna to speak to the comment that one of the witnesses made um, or said about insurance companies paying for intentional acts. I know this has been, I think at least one other witness has spoken to this. Um, VLCT passive does not cover situations where the harm was expected or intended or brought on by dishonesty, bad faith or deliberate violation of law. We are not aware of any insurer out there that will provide coverage for criminal wrongdoing. This bill is currently written uh, potentially puts municipalities in the state, thus taxpayers financially on the hook for criminal wrongdoing of an officer during the course of their duties. That would be you know, a pretty major uninsured expense um, and one that could seriously harm public entities. I just wanna clarify that for the record. Lastly, we also have concerns about this bill impacting passive's ability to purchase reinsurance protection, which allows us to provide adequate insurance limits to our members. I don't wanna get into the weeds on what this is, but just, just a quick snapshot is, you know, we as a small pool, we can to, to provide adequate limits to our members. We can only insure, you know, full, insure so much of that limit and then we have to purchase protection above that. Our reinsurers have taken notice to this bill. We've talked to a couple of them and uh, you know, are concerned with it. And so we, we don't have any, anything that I can say other than they're taking notice and that we are concerned over time that there might be an impact on our ability to get reinsurance and thus provide ins adequate insurance limits to our members. Um, it's too early to know, like I said, the exact impact, but we certainly expect some reaction over time by our reinsurers. Um, in summary, we believe this bill will impact state and local governments in, one, in many ways and compromise, compromise your effective legislation, legislative action in earlier years to enact law enforcement reform with a focus on training, accountability, and transparency. My understanding is that the reform work to date has been a collaborative effort between a broad group of interesting, interested parties, including law enforcement, this bill seems to get away from that approach, which I do not think is good for, is for the good of all. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts and Phil and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Well, I have a couple of questions, sure. Joe. And, yep. uh, and if you don't, I'd like to understand the current state of yep. insurance for police departments and individual officers. When um, we often read in the paper about a settlement, for example, uh, just read about a settlement in Bennington of $130,000 with uh, obviously neither party can talk about the settlement. So we don't really know as citizens of that community, what really happened or, you know, all that information. But when is a settlement is reached, does the insurance company pay for that or is the town paying for that? Um, Phil, you want to take that? You're muted, Phil. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had to find the right. Okay, we're all we all do that all the time. Uh, initially, for the record, Phil Woodward, I'm general counsel at Passive, and uh, I know the case that you're referring to, Senator. Uh, mm -hmm. In that particular case, other than the deductible, the uh, member, the town, did not pay any of the uh, settlement directly. That said, uh, it does go into the. Uh, uh, calculus for the premium and uh, the contribution that the member is going to need to make in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. Ultimately, the funds for the uh, settlement all came from taxpayers. Yeah, so it's like my insurance policy. If my wife has an accident, eventually we end up paying the insurance company whatever they paid us usually um, for a minor vendor bender. Um, they increase my rates and uh, increase your rates or in some cases won't provide you with coverage anymore. But uh, to your point, yes, there's no free lunch. Uh, okay. And in this, in this particular case, the question really is whether or not the taxpayers or the treasury for that specific municipality would pay the settlement or would it be spread out among the other members who are all making contributions and spreading a risk. Right. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, it's all coming from the same property tax base. Yeah, being a, being a small, the, sorry, being a small member-owned risk pool, you, 
any, any loss like that is spread amongst the rates for the entire group, but then each member is individually experience rated. So when I gave you that $8,100 on average, that is just, just an average, like the, the, the town of Bennington, you know, depending on how much we paid out potentially is paying more than that 8,100 just based on their own experience. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And they've had, I think three recent settlements. Um, I might be off by one. Um, secondarily, when it's an individual officer, you spoke about three hundred to a thousand. Yeah, three hundred to a thousand per officer for personal liability. Does that indicate that they don't have that now? Yeah, I, I can't answer whether all don't. Um, you know, I think it's something new that a lot of the uh, unions are starting to to introduce to the officers and through the you know through their CBA process. I also know that these companies are pushing these products, and I'm not aware of you know, how good these companies are and what the coverage is and whether there is coverage in certain situations. I can't speak to that because they're private companies, but I have yeah. received emails from these companies where I've seen premium estimates and in talking to the Colorado insurance pool like ours, you know, they do, they do have that offered there. Of course, their bill or their um, yeah, bill is a little different over there than it is here, but that's just a range that we came up with. Well, one would think that, I mean, I have personal, liability insurance and it's called i think it's called an umbrella but you know it, it's, i wouldn't be without it um, mm -hmm. you know and who knows what i could get sued for um but anyway um so i wasn't aware that officers currently don't have personal liability insurance yeah i would no. I, I thought it would was already covered some of the some towns have said if 254 passed, they would still indemnify the officers. They would still cover the officers. The, the idea of the uh, 25,000 or whatever is less, uh, forgot the percentage of the, of the settlement. Um, but is that pretty universal? And that, would that be allowed under PACIF? Um, so... I, I don't know the answer to that right off. I'm, I'm not, I have not talked to, to members about that. Um, I think that, you know, that they, I think you're correct in that it would be very rare circumstance, I think, where that would be assessed against an officer. But I don't, I don't know. We, in some of the cases we would have, there might be coverage and other cases there may not through passive. Okay. Yeah. Other, other questions for either Mr. Woodard or Mr. Demetia? And I flubbed the name again. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Damiata. Damiata, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, thank you both for joining us this morning. Really helpful information uh, to better understand exactly what the landscape is. Our next witness is Kevin Gaffney, who's the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Financial Regulation and Insurance. And I want to thank Mr. Gaffney for being here on his day off or vacation. Um, we really appreciate your stopping by. Um, spending time with us, especially when you're on vacation. Well, thank you. And for the record, Kevin Gaffney, Deputy Commissioner of Insurance at the Vermont Department of Financial Regulation. Uh, yeah, we all know there's no real vacations during the legislative session, so it goes with the, goes <laughs> with the job. <laughs> um, yes, I'm here to, um, well, first I'll just talk about generally what our, our role is and our engagement is with the insurance marketplace. Uh, you know, our, our overarching goal, <coughs> at DFR is to um, protect this, the solvency of the marketplace and protect consumers at the same time. And, and those, uh, those often work hand in hand. And I think this is, this is an example of that. Um, the bill does, uh, and, and just understanding the nature of how insurance companies approach risk, um, they certainly look at uh, and react to what they see in legislative changes. Uh, the, the uh, Colorado law that was passed, um, there's already been some reaction to that, and I'll touch on that uh, later. Um, but generally, the way insurance companies will react to changes in exposure is to either um, mitigate the risk, eliminate the risk, or uh, transfer the risk. Um, in, the, in this case, I think we've already uh, seen that um, in, in Colorado that um, 
there have been, I think the, the committee was looking and Ledge Council reached out to us for data on what the pricing impact has been uh, to date in, in Colorado and New Mexico, uh, two states that have had similar legislation. Um, it is too early. I know that there was already testimony on this, but I'll just restate that it is too early. Uh, there isn't specific data available yet. Uh, in those in those states, we're still within the statute of limitations, um, so it's not um, it's not uncommon that those claims could still be brought forth. Um, the pricing, the actual like cost of insurance and pricing reaction, is often la lagging and, and has to be based on that change in experience. Um, but um, I think once there are activities in the marketplace and settlements. Uh, there, you're going to see that reaction uh, in a rather responsive way. The more immediate um, response can often be, and I think um, uh, Joe Damiata from VLCT spoke to it briefly, is what the reinsurers will do, because the reinsurers um, now carry the, the heavy exposure. <clears throat> and they have the arrangements with the their, their insureds, in this case, uh, municipalities through passive um, to uh, have a retention limit for those individual municipalities. So it, it wouldn't take but just a strike of a pen to change those retention limits for those municipalities, maybe by a half a million, a million or more dollars as they see the exposure. So that's just the general you know, landscape of how insurance companies will look at, uh, look at things. In terms of elimination, um, I've seen it and heard of it in Colorado. For example, when Colorado went to renew their uh, reinsurance arrangement, um, they uh, did not have the, a multiple bidder situation where they had uh, multiple interest in their renewals, um, and, and they ultimately did have an increase in their in their price. Um, and that's you know just. That's one thing that we do to protect the marketplace is we want the market to be competitive. We want multiple insurers to participate in the market. And when there are fewer insurers, then that often is a, a, another driver for increasing uh, the price. So, um, so there's, a, there's another, uh, there's, so, so the data is too early. Um, um, and, and, and I would say the way insurance companies or even us as regulators assess risk in the marketplace is to first to try to identify what the, what the problem is in the marketplace, what's the insurance solution that we're trying to solve, or what's the market issue that's going to require insurance. Um, and, and so that's, that's certainly the, one of the disciplines that insurance companies will undertake. The other one is to try to mitigate loss. And, you know, we've done this in Vermont, and this is just an uh, unrelated example, but in high-risk workers' compensation classes like logging, you know, we have a program in, in the state to mitigate those losses, to, to not just um, uh, have a program that is uh, a book on a shelf to... Um, to hopefully get lower rates for employers, but it's actually a program that does worksite evaluations and risk assessments and provides changes to the way things are done um, to mitigate loss. And that mitigation does save the insurance company money, but it also prevents workers from being injured and out of work for extended period of time. And ultimately those employers to uh, avoid them paying higher costs. And we've seen some real results with that. And I just share that because it, we're six years into the program and insurance rates in the workers' comp market um, in that high risk class are down over 40%. Um, so, um, so getting back to this particular issue, the way I, the way I look at it from a, a loss control and risk mitigation standpoint is looking at, I've been looking at what's happening with the task force in Connecticut and those kind of pillars of effective policing and community policing. And those seem like the, the type of uh, endeavors that a loss control program would encompass. Um, uh, training, communication, uh, and um, um, uh, awareness. You know, there's a lot of this is an awareness issue of 
uh, different actions and real and, and community engagement. So I just, I'm not gonna speak in any detail to, to the activities of that task force other than to say that I think that is a proactive way to mitigate loss. And in this particular case, that would be to uh, mitigate limit or or reduce the impact to the to the Vermont public uh, for these type of situations that the bill is is looking at. I will now get back to what I was I touched on briefly is that this bill is broader than the Colorado bill in terms of what it encompasses. The Colorado bill folk is limited to violations of state constitutional law. Um, this bill encompasses that plus of violations of statute and common law. So it gets down to a, a negligence level that does encompass a lot of activities that, um, uh, and because of the nature of this bill would also encompass the in, in, uh, incurring of legal fees uh, for that would be incurred by the defendant uh, based on the language in the bill. Um, that, you know, there could be some unintended consequences here that if we, if we, spend perhaps uh, that, um, uh, you know, ounce, the ounce of prevention uh, uh, up front, um, we could mitigate a lot of these losses. Plus, I think it just would offer um, just more enhanced communications between police and the community. That is outside my lane, so I'm going to stop it there. But it, there is a relationship between what I see going on in the Connecticut task force okay, and better. what yeah. loss control and loss risk better. mitigation yes. does within an insurance operation. Can you talk a little bit more about the Connecticut task force? Is that a, a local or state effort? It's a, it's an, yeah, it's a state effort, uh, um, Mr. Chair. And it, it's, it, it's a multidisciplinary effort. So it's, there's a number of, um, participants on that, and certainly uh, we can, you know, we could obtain more information on it. But honestly, I haven't, I haven't delved uh, deeply into the activities of the task force. Other than that, I, I, this workers' comp program that I've discussed, that's an, a multidisciplinary action. That's the departments of labor, the departments of forest, parks, and recreation, and DFR, um, uh, and. Um, and, uh, and other, other uh, uh, non, non-public agencies uh, collaborating. So, um, and, and the community and the business community and, that, and all of those things would be maybe different uh, players, but there's kind of the sim similar concepts. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear about that. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Are there other questions for Mr. Gaffney where we let him get back to his vacation? Senator Baruth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gaffney. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just wondering generally if we think about qualified immunity as something that was um, as a doctrine designed to shield certain entities from risk, is it possible to say that under that doctrine uh, municipalities and law enforcement agencies and individual officers have enjoyed a kind of um, protection from rates going up uh, that was artificial in the sense that it was produced by that court-written doctrine. Does that, uh, does that seem a fair statement? Really can't I really can't speak to that because I haven't there isn't any analysis I've ever done specifically in this space in terms of what I mean you're asking me a general question about whether a, a construct has has reduced or, or or increased insurance costs and it would be irresponsible for me to give you a just a I generally agree when I don't I don't have enough data to really make well, the assessment. Rather than uh, framing it as cost, what about if we just um, went with the general idea of risk? Um, there's less risk for those entities under qualified immunity, right? For municipalities and law enforcement agencies? It's, poss it's, it's possible there are, I, I think, um, 
and and I think this the the bill the bill is focused on something a little more broad than uh, what other states have taken. So yes, yeah. I think there's there's potentially risk that's uh, less. This bill obviously does increase the risk. So if you're saying um, what exists now and what this bill would in- introduce, there definitely is less risk now. Yeah. So I thank you for that. I I guess what I'm saying is it strikes me as self-evident that under uh, qualified immunity, we have created less risk for certain entities. And that if we then decide that that's unfair to victims and we remove some of that qualified immunity, then we are by definition shifting risk. But I don't think that um, personally we're shifting risk in an unfair way, but rather we're we're restoring a kind of balance uh, that we've artificially um, upset with the doctrine to this point. So um, I haven't been surprised by the testimony because I, I think it's pretty clear that risk is going to be borne by different people as opposed to being um, borne now entirely by the, the victims, injury and risk. It would now be um, moved to people who are in some cases, perpetrating the acts and, and the people who indemnify them. So anyway, just yeah. wanted to, to make that point. Yeah, and, 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 that, and, and, and just going back to my workers' comp uh, um, example, I, get, I guess that would be um, like increasing some benefits under that workers' comp program to pay out more, and that would enhance the risk. But what I described in that program is we're actually doing things proactively to mitigate the risk up front. And I do think that Vermont has an opportunity to be a model for police reform and, uh, and, and should look at endeavors like what's happening with the task force in Connecticut. Um, because I don't, you, you could have a more immediate impact to Vermonters and Vermont, uh, the Vermont public by engaging in those activities immediately uh, versus what this bill would do in terms of having also the same statute of limitations and, and the like. So just uh, it's hard to just look at these things in a vacuum, because I, I think when you're talking about risk management, there's not one lever. There's multiple, multiple levers that you want to engage to um, to mitigate loss. And, you know, again, a lot of times the mitigation of loss is seen by the public as, oh, that's just going to save the insurance company money. No, I mean, they were talking about eliminating uh, adverse outcomes and harm to the public. And so that's just what, what, you know, I just want to just have that fuller view of what, what I'm, what I'm describing here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from Mr. Gaffney? Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good to see you. Thank you. I I don't think I'll get invited back to Florida, though, Um, but (laughs) at least I enjoyed this trip. (laughs) Take care now. You too. Bye now. Bye. All right. Our next witness is Wilda White, Um, and uh, this is her second or third um, visit with us. We appreciate your sticking with the committee and giving your thoughts. Thank you, uh, Senator Sears. Good morning, um, committee members. My name is Wilda White, um, and I've been invited to uh, testify here today as in my role as a consultant, a policy and training consultant with the Department of Public Safety. I just wanted to talk about three things um, that were raised um, in a previous hearing after I actually had left. Um, and I, I just wanted to um, respond to some of, of, of those issues that were on the uh, committee members' minds. The first issue um, was a question posed by uh, Senator Sears uh, in response to a hypothetical that I had raised. And so I had suggested that if a law enforcement officer um, received an order to go out and you know, tear down that, the Sears camp um, and, and did so, um, and it was later determined that that was unconstitutional. Um, that officer, uh, who in good faith had uh, you know, done that, would be liable under S-254 as written. 
Um, and um, there was a discussion about whether that analysis was, was, was um, correct or whether one, that officer would be able to raise this defense of good faith. And there was, this, there was a suggestion that the officer would be able to raise that defense of good faith. And I wanted to explain to the, uh, the committee why I uh, don't believe that would be the case. Uh, the good faith defense uh, is a common law immunity. And under this bill as written, um, common law immunities uh, do not apply uh, in an action brought under S-254. Um, on page uh, two, lines 12 through 13, um, the bill as currently written provides, and I'm quoting, an action brought pursuant to this section is not subject to common law doctrines of immunity as a defense to liability. The second reason why I don't believe that the defense of, of uh, good faith would apply to an action brought under S-254 is because of the of, uh, language at page three of the bill on line seven through nine, which states that an agency shall indemnify the law enforcement officer, except if the law enforcement agency determines that the law enforcement officer did not act in good faith. A court would likely interpret this language to mean that the legislature intended for liability to attach even where an officer acts in good faith. Um, and so when courts as a co-equal branch of government tries to um, figure out what a, a you know, statute means, it's really trying to give, do what the legislature wants the law to do. And in these two instances, I think S-254 is written makes it very clear that this legislation does not want the defense of, of, of good faith to apply to this action. And the, and, the, and the last thing I'll say on this point is that, the, uh, maybe I'll say two more things on this point. I, th I think a court would also say that, um, you know, this bill gets rid of qualified immunity. And qualified immunity is a good faith defense, but it's objective good faith, not subjective, meaning that the courts have written qualified immunity as a good faith defense. And they put in this requirement of clearly established to make it objective. So it's like, you're, you're, you're not liable um, if, that, if an objectively reasonable officer would not have known that was a violation. So a court would say if, the, if, if this legislature was getting rid of qualified immunity, which is a good faith defense, they couldn't have possibly intended for an officer to be able to raise this defense of good faith to an action brought under S-254. And the final reason why I think that a court would not, uh, or we couldn't rely uh, reliably on a court allowing an officer to raise the defense of good faith is because this is really an unsettled issue of law. Um, courts often will look to other courts um, to see how they are handling uh, these types of issues. Um, and because the, this is a you know this is a rarely used defense. They would probably look to federal courts, and in Section 1983 uh, jurisprudence, it's an unsettled question of law whether the good faith defense would apply to non-governmental actors who were sued under Section 1983. Currently, there is a split in the circuit courts, with the Third Circuit saying it does not apply, and most other circuits saying it does apply. And the US Supreme Court itself has raised the question in three different cases, but has declined to answer the question. So for all those reasons, that's why I gave that example of when an officer does something in good faith, like serving a warrant that's facially valid, but turns out to be not, uh, or doing something like uh, you know, following an order of the mayor and tearing down uh, Sears camp. This is why I, I believe that even when those officers are acting in good faith, um, they would still be liable under um, S-254. The next issue I wanted to talk about that was I think touched on a little bit during that hearing was this issue of who's going to pay for a law enforcement's defense cost under the bill. Uh, currently S-254 is written, um, 
it, it doesn't currently under the current law in statute, when a law enforcement officer is sued by statute, uh, if it's if it's state, <clears throat> the attorney general uh, represents the law enforcement officer, and if it's a municipality by statute the uh, municipality has to provide that legal defense, both attorney's fees and costs. However, this bill as currently written um, <clears throat> excludes those provisions. It says notwithstanding those provisions or those provisions do not apply to this bill. So it leaves the law enforcement officer without any ability um, uh, other than their own resources to pay for um, attorney's fees and costs. And that is the most expensive part of litigation. You know, oftentimes we buy insurance and we think, oh, I'm protected if I'm sued, you know, if there's a judgment against me. But the judgment is actually the small consideration about what, law, what insurance policies do. The big thing that insurance policies do is they provide you a legal defense. And usually they'll provide you a legal defense that's way broader than what they'll pay for ultimately. And in this bill, um, you've eliminated those statutory provisions that provide uh, a law enforcement officer, a, a legal defense and, and legal cost. Um, and I think it's really kind of fundamentally unfair to ask a law enforcement officer who's operating in good faith um, on a salary that's not really intended to pay for litigation costs that could you know, run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and my concern is, um, you know, if, if a law enforcement officer doesn't want to take out a loan or mortgage their house or whatever to pay these costs, it may be in their best interest to simply default because they are not going to be liable uh, for the judgment. Um, and I, I, I would be concerned that that would mean that, you know, these municipalities would have to indemnify um, the this default judgment. Um, it, it I think it creates maybe a risk that hasn't been fully um, addressed or thought out. And I, I've, I've been in communication with the CEO of the insurance company, Primus Insurance Company, um, that's written the policies in Colorado um, as a result of that bill that law enforcement officers are free to um, purchase uh, to the rate of $300 a year. Um, and I asked, I said, does that $300 a year uh, pay for attorney's fees and costs? And he said, no. Um, that only covers the $25,000 that they might have to pay. So um, he also told me that he's only sold a handful uh, of those policies um, across the country and that they are preparing to um, uh, you know, sell more, but they have yet to. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll stop there on that point. Um, and then the last question I think that um, is unclear from the bill is whether S-254 would be retroactive. And by retroactive, I mean, will it apply to conduct that occurred before S-254, if it becomes law, becomes law? Um, and I think the, the reason why I think that's worthwhile considering um, is because you know, it really does you know, increase the risk if it is retroactive, because it could apply to cases that have already been dismissed. Uh, on qualified immunity or for some other reason. They could refile if the statute of limitations has not run. And the statute of limitations in Vermont that's, uh, it, that's envisioned by this bill is three years. Um, it could also apply to cases that are currently pending. You know, people could just tack on another cause of action uh, for this bill. Um, and it could also apply to conduct that's already occurred that was done in good faith. Um, so that facially valid warrant, when someone goes out and serves that currently, you know, there's no liability if they did so in good faith. But if S-254, something they did in good faith and that was legal and not actionable when they did it, would then become um, actionable. Um, and so those are, and I, and I will also say that, you know, we've seen three bills that have purportedly attempted to end qualified immunity. We've seen Colorado do it. The Colorado bill, the bill is silent as to whether it's retroactive. In New Mexico, they explicitly say that it's not. It only applies to actions that conduct that occurred um, after the bill was passed. And in Connecticut, um, the same. They say explicitly that it only applies to conduct 
um, after um, the bill was, was passed. Um, and so, I mean, I think those are um, the, the main points that were raised that I, I, I wanted to, um, to uh, bring to the, the committee's attention. Um, and the final thing is, is that I, there's lots of questions about why we're singling out law enforcement officers. And we've been thinking about it from the perspective of the law enforcement officers. And I would invite you to, con, con, to um, revisit that question or consider it from the perspective of a victim. Um, of, of uh, governmental misconduct, we'll call it. Or, and so if a correctional officer uh, harms somebody, they would not, they would have to um, contend with the doctrine of qualified immunity in all other immunities. Um, and if they successfully did that, they, their recovery in many cases would be capped by statute because under the current law, for example, if you sue under the Vermont Tort Claims Act, there's a $500,000 limit per claim and two per, per, occur, uh, per claim and two, two million per occurrence. However, you happen to be, you know, be, be harmed by a law enforcement officer, there are no caps. You know, you could your recovery could be whatever you wanted, whatever you're able to to to, to successfully argue, um, and you would and you wouldn't have to attend with any of those defenses. So in effect, what this bill is, is setting up a two-tier uh, victim compensation um, system. And I just wonder if that's what we want to do, whether we want to um, prefer um, some victims over others. Um, and I'll just leave you um, with that. And I really thank you for your attention. I, I did uh, in, introduce into the record an analysis of of uh, the other bills that have been passed um, in uh, New Mexico, Connecticut, and um, Colorado uh, compared to um, the Vermont bill, just for your consideration. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that or anything else that comes up. Thank you. Uh, I believe Peggy posted your analysis on the website, on our webpage. Um, I get, I, what your analysis of the other states and uh, New Mexico, you said they had done away with qualified immunity for everyone. Am I yes. correct in that? That is correct. New Mexico um, did away with everybody. Yeah. And they don't allow um, what, you, the, the, you don't sue the employee, you sue the public body. So in our case, it might be the town of Bennington. Yes. Senator White. So I'm curious about that in terms of um, certain people have absolute immunity, including us. And I wondered if in the New Mexico, they just did away with qualified immunity or if they also addressed the issue of absolute immunity. They did not. They only got rid of qualified immunity and they left intact absolute immunity, legislative immunity, and any statutory immunity and any, and any common law immunity. They okay, only got rid of qualified immunity. Thank you. I, I can stand to be corrected on the issue of retroactivity, but I think unless the legislature actually put something in the legislation to make it retroactive, it's not retroactive. Um, so, uh, but, <clears throat> Ben might correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have to not withstand certain language in order to make something that's right. And that, yes, Senator Sears, Ben Novogrossi, Office of Legislative Council. That's normally, normally there has to be explicit language inserted in to express retroactivity. Um, however, I think uh, Ms. White's testimony is that in litigation, it may be able to um, be an amendment to a pleading or something after the fact. But, you know, that is something that can be clarified in language, uh, depending on the committee's um, perspective. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll keep that in mind for the any redraft. Thank you, Ben. Any other questions for Wilda? Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate you having me back. Um, Jay Diaz uh, from 
I almost said VLCT, but it's um, my <clears throat> ACLU. Yeah, more, more alphabet soup for you, ACLU. Yeah. Uh, morning, Jay. Good morning. Jay Diaz, General Counsel for the ACLU. It's a pleasure to be back with you all. And I'm going to do my best to keep this brief. I've got four points that I just want to get across. The first one is uh, I'd like us to remember why we are here and what S-254 is about. It's about protecting victims of Vermont state and constitutional rights violations. It's about access to justice, making sure that those people's rights can be vindicated when they are violated by a Vermont police officer. Now, uh, the opponents of this bill have not said anything about the victims and about what rights they should have, how they should be compensated when these things happen. They have not talked about them at all. And I think that that's an important thing to recognize because that is what this bill is about. That's who this bill is meant to protect. And, you know, we've, we've provided a few cases and of course, we've, we've had attorneys come and speak, or, or attorneys have come and spoke, uh, spoken to you all, David Slay, Bradley Meyerson, myself, others, who represented individuals, victims uh, of uh, rights violations at, at the hands of police officers in Vermont. Uh, I also had the opportunity just yesterday, actually, to speak to one of the people who were referenced in the cases that we've provided to you, where qualified immunity prevented um, that person's rights, uh, that person from being compensated. Um, his name was Tim Keene. This is the case Keene v. Schneider. And Senator Sears, you mentioned it yesterday that, or you mentioned it last time we spoke. Uh, this is the case where uh, a man was in his house. He let the police into the house. Uh, they wanted to arrest him uh, on suspicion of DUI, but he was in his home. He said, I don't understand. I'm not, I'm not going with you. Uh, I got my my young daughter here uh, and she's all alone. He told me yesterday that her mother had, had passed away earlier. Um, and uh, when he when he refused to go with the officers, they got physical. Uh, and at the bottom of the stairs, you know, he they started kicking him and broke several of his ribs, I think broke his thumb. And his daughter's at the top of the sca- stairs crying uh, asking them to stop, to stop. Uh, the officers hauled him away and left left him there. Uh, you know, and, and there was tape of this. There was uh, there were recordings. The charge against him was dismissed, and still the Second Circuit said, you know, even if your rights were violated, doesn't matter because qualified immunity, because the officers have immunity in this situation. That's the kind of situation we're trying to address. And uh, Mr. Keene, I believe, is gonna, gonna submit a letter to the committee about his experience. So again, the second point is S-254 provides a solution for these situations. It creates a specific right of action that's reasonable, limited, and encourages vindication of people's rights. We believe in these rights, we all do here. To make them meaningful and to vindicate them is what's important. Uh, and I think that this bill actually does, goes a long way to making that possible. It also supports accountability for law enforcement. It supports racial justice across our state. And it's what nearly 75% of Vermonters want to see happen. Now, the opponents of the bill, unfortunately, have not offered anything in response to what the proponents have said, except unfounded assertions. There's been no support for their concerns, only speculation. We haven't seen any examples showing that this would present a problem, that this this legislation would would, would present a real problem. We haven't seen any data along those lines. We haven't seen examples from other states that have passed very similar legislation uh, of what, you know, any problems at the town, state, or for law enforcement officers. And they've offered no real (laughs) criticism They simply oppose the bill. That is not how this process should be working. They oppose it in large part, it seems, because they're concerned about finances. But when we talk about victims, we need to, uh, victims of rights violations, we need to balance, as Senator Bruth was was saying earlier, we need a better balance here. And that is what S-254 is about. 
We also believe that S254 will go a long way to, as uh, the um, Mr. Gaffney spoke, to incentivizing towns to mitigate their risk in a more concrete way. Doing things like community policing, doing things like having civilian oversight and civilian control, having better training, better supervision. These are all things we want to incentivize. And we do believe this bill will support that those efforts. Now, opponents have also said that this bill is coming at the wrong time. It's motivated by, by animus towards law enforcement. And that is simply not true. The public, by and large, if you look at various studies around, from around the country, um, from, you could say, before 2020, before George Floyd and after, show that the public, by vast majorities, supports law enforcement. But it also supports getting rid of these unnecessary immunities, making the process fair for those who are victimized uh, and have their rights violated at the hands of law enforcement. The last thing I just want to say to, to conclude is, you know, let's remember, again, who this bill is for. It's not for uh, primarily the law enforcement community. It's not for, uh, for municipalities. It's for victims of rights violations, people who suffer and have no recourse. That's not every victim, but a good portion of them. And we shouldn't allow that to go on in our state. And opponents act like these things have not happened in Vermont. But when we look at the news over the past several years, over many years, we have numerous cases of people being victimized um, at the hands of law enforcement officers across the state. Uh, where their rights were violated. We have, um, and there are more people who have not come forward or who don't bring cases because they'll likely get kicked out on qualified immunity. You've heard testimony again from attorneys like David Slay and others about the experience of these individuals. You've heard about specific cases that we've put before you. You know the data that's out there that, that Vermont law enforcement stop, search, and in some cases use force disproportionately against people, people of color in our state. And this bill is about increasing justice to prevent these regularly, regularly occurring injustices, both in the field and in our courts. Vermonters' state constitutional rights and civil rights should be meaningful and upheld when violated. To make them meaningful, to give them power, we must remove these immunities and make it easier for people to vindicate their rights. And with that, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Senator White who has a question or a comment. So thank you, Jay. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions. Remind me the case that you, that you uh, and then we've heard a lot about this case. And it ended up in the Second Circuit, and they were the ones that. So, did it start in a Vermont um, court and then go to the Second Circuit? Is that the way it happened? And and why did it go to the Second Circuit? It must have. I, I'm just so if does if we eliminated qualified immunity in Vermont, does that impact Second Circuit cases because? Um, that's a different court. I, that I don't know if I you understood my question. Okay, great, thanks. I do. Yeah, no, it's 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 a good question. Um, so I, I think a couple things to know off the bat for attorneys like myself who who represent people whose rights have been violated, plaintiffs. Uh, you at this right now and before you know, uh, and earlier for Zulo and other cases, it's very difficult to bring a case or it wouldn't make a lot of sense to bring a case in Vermont state court about those rights because uh, about your Vermont constitutional rights, because there's no attorney's fees attached. You still have qualified immunity to contend with. And your case is likely to be removed if you bring any federal claims. So you bring in a federal court. So that, that case, Keen v. Schneider, started in federal court oh, okay. in Vermont and then was appealed to the Second Circuit. 
my feeling, and I think this is a foregone conclusion, um, maybe not a foregone conclusion, but my feeling would be that at least in future situations, if S-254 became law, you would give people a fair chance to have their Vermont rights adjudicated, so Vermont constitutional rights, and you would have the opportunity to do so without worrying about qualified immunity. And you would be encouraged because you could still access and have the possibility of attorney's fees. Uh, so this bill is really about those Vermont rights. It's about looking at our Vermont civil and constitutional rights and making those meaningful for victims. Um, we can't do anything about what federal courts are doing and what federal law says, but we can do something about what our courts do. So can, if I can follow up, so if we pass this, and then, then the Second Circuit Court or federal court could still um, apply qualified immunity because this just would affect Vermont courts. And the second part of this question is, you, you refer always to cons Vermont constitutional rights, but this bill also says statutory and common law um, violations. So I, if you would comment on that a little bit about, because I, I haven't heard much talk about that, just constitutional rights. Sure. So to the first question, uh, well, it's uh, the, the reason that, so the second circuit wouldn't review or federal courts don't review state constitutional claims. So it wouldn't have anything to say about those claims um, now or in the future if this bill were to pass. Because it doesn't, it doesn't have jurisdiction over those claims. The, so your second question, Senator White. Yes, the bill references common law claims, uh, statutory claims and constitutional claims. And what I, I think I've always said is civil and constitutional rights, civil rights being statutory and common law uh, and constitutional being, being constitutional. That's how I view civil rights as like statutory rights, such as our anti-discrimination laws. So when we look at uh, Vermont's state anti-discrimination law, the, the Public Accommodations Act, you know, those are the kinds of things that I'm talking about that would be covered by this bill and, and would, would allow the, would have the same structure. Um, the Federal Civil Rights Act, the Section 1983, which, which is the right of action you sue for, for federal rights, civil and, and, and constitutional, uh, does it similarly. So we're kind of just trying to mirror that uh, in, in some ways. It's true that the federal Section 1983 Civil Rights Act does not include, to my understanding, does not include common law rights, but that's because common law rights are not adjudicated at the federal level. Usually they're, they're, they're more based in the state, uh, in state, state law. Well, I'm still a little I, confused about civil rights, yeah, civil or civil rights, and, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, actually, if I could follow up on that, because I share your confusion. Um, Will the White testified that in Colorado it just covers um, constitutional rights and not common law and not other matters. So um, I always thought civil rights were covered in the Constitution. So I, I think it's a, a common way to look at it, and I, I think it's it's fine that civil rights are in my eyes are typically those that are covered by statute and they're, you know, as in they come from civil law. So, so that would be what you all create. And those would be rights such as, you know, at the federal level, it would be things like uh, title nine or title seven, these, these, you know, the, the civil rights act of 1964, things like that, that actually provide substantive rights. Uh, to people not from the Constitution. They're based in equal protection, which is a constitutional framework, but they're much more specific and, and have a little, um, and, and, are, and were you know, created by legislators like yourself. That's, that's at least how I'm viewing it and, and how, I, how I think we, we look at it from, from our perspective. 
Okay. What if we followed the Colorado model? What would not get covered? Well, as I said, that what would not get covered would be things like Vermont's anti-discrimination law, uh, the Vermont Public Accommodations Act, and uh, it wouldn't cover, for instance, the new use of force law that that you all passed last last year. So there are substantive rights that I think people that we'd want to see under this bill that would not be covered if we didn't include those statutory rights. Okay. Other questions for Jay? One final question, Jay. The, the bill only covers police officers and has been criticism that it doesn't cover other groups. What, do you have a response to that? Yeah, the ACLU is not opposed to including other uh, um, uh, other government employees, but uh, and as I've said, uh, so so we're open to that possibility. However, as I've said, I think it's important to recognize that law enforcement officers have a very special role in society and in our state, and and that the the importance of meeting that great power with great accountability seems to be of the. You know, paramount importance to us. Senator White. I hate to keep beating this one, but could you just help me understand here? What we've heard is that in Zulu, it created a right of action. And what they, the court said is that we needed something like qualified immunity, not necessarily qualified immunity, but something like, and it created a right of action for the victims. And the, the, what I understand is that the main issue was that it only covered, the interpretation was that it only covered state police. It didn't cover other law enforcement officers. Could you tell me why, why that court case does not address this. And if we came up with the something like qualified immunity and included all law enforcement, that that would not be um, an approach. So Zulo, which is, you know, I represented Mr. Zulo with my colleague, Leah Ernst. Uh, we, we won that Supreme Court case. It does a couple of things. And what you're talking about is it created a right of action under Article 11. So that's our search and seizure protections. It didn't talk about rights of action under other constitutional rights or statutory rights. So that's important to note, of course. And what it did was create this qualified immunity like test to determine whether a person who had their Article 11 rights by, uh, violated by a state employee could access uh, money damages. And that qualified immunity test, uh, this test similar to qualified immunity that they developed, uh, we feel is an important one. It's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't get us all the way. So the legislature certainly could look at what Zulo did and 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 use that test as a as a jumping off point. Uh, we just feel that it's necessary for us to capture all victims of uh, police misconduct. That we don't limit the that we don't have a limited any kind of limited immunity. May I ask one more question? I'm sorry sure. to. Could you could you talk about the difference between? I know that Colorado just did constitutional; they didn't do statutory. And how has that limited um, victims' ability in Colorado to um, seek compensation under they, right. because um, they didn't include statutory or common? Right. Senator White, I got, I just got to say I'm impressed by the. The, the depth that you've uh, gone on this because it's really, it is this important stuff and it, it's, 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 you know, it's um, important for us to tease out these differences. As I said, I think that the differences 
that you're seeing from the Colorado bill, the Colorado statute versus this bill, uh, they didn't include statutory rights. And I think so when someone's rights under the Colorado Civil Rights Act, like our Public Accommodations Act are violated, qualified immunity could still apply in those situations in Colorado. That's what we're trying to avoid here in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there's a lot of, you know, one thing that the opponents of the bill, as I said, have, they have not offered, you know, different language or, or changes. Uh, and I think that, and they've just said that they just straight oppose the bill and that's it. And I, I think uh, Commissioner Sherling said on the first day he, he appeared, the first day of testimony, he said, we're not here to make this bill better. We're here to oppose it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's unfortunate because that's usually how bills are made. <laughs> and I think that there's a lot of work that can be done and, and uh, if necessary. And I hope that, uh, that, that we can continue that conversation. We do feel that this bill, as it's written by and large, does what is necessary to ensure access to justice for victims and, uh, and that this state takes the next step forward, as other states have, in, in ensuring that those rights for, for victims. And I do appreciate the fact that Commissioner Sherling said that and that they're not here to make this bill better. But the proponents of the bill have said the same thing. We're not here to make this bill, to change this bill. We're here to support this bill. So just that, I mean, that's the way advocacy works for, for bills. And then it's the committee's responsibility to, to tease that out. Sure. I, I, oh, yes, I think that's absolutely true. All, all, I, all I'm saying is that I think, you know, we'd be open to learning what people would think would make this bill better so that we could, um, could comment on that and, and could address it in the future. Thank you. Um, other questions for Jay? Um, I mean, are, I have a thousand questions, but I think I better not ask them today. Um, but I, I do think um, uh, reading parts of Zulo, it's clear to me that the Supreme Court was suggesting that um, the legislature should step in and should um, do something. Um, but one quote is the legislature may provide and limit a statutory remedy for constitutionally based tort violations. Absent legislation providing a meaningful remedy for constitutional thought. As long as the remedy provides meaningful redress for significant violations. And I, I'm not sure what significant violation means and I'm not at liberty to go down to just Chief Justice Ryber's office and ask what's significant, but um, I think that they were signaling that it may be time after 55 years for the legislature to do something in, in terms of qualified immunity. So um, anyway, it is Senator Baruth. Um, Jay, I appreciate your testimony and in the spirit of what you were talking about, making a bill, exploring changes, one of the things that Senator White was pointing out was, and, and other witnesses, uh, Wilda as well, is that Colorado had a more limited scope. Um, how, would, how would you feel if the committee went in that direction um, and removed the common law and uh, those other pieces and, and centered it around constitutional redress. Well, I suppose for, uh, on behalf of the ACLU, we would want to see what those changes were before making significant comments. However, it's, a, you know, what's, you know, there are some critical portions of the bill, uh, and so I guess I, I guess we'll have to just wait and see. Um, that's that's kind of where where I think we're at right now. Okay, 
And and that's fair. I guess, you know, this committee has done under this chair has done a lot of progressive work uh, in reform over the last five years uh, in particular. And when we're doing that, a lot of times we are looking at templates that are in existence. Here, the drafting has gone a little further than Colorado. So it, it wouldn't be a crazy notion to think that as we move it forward, one of the ways toward possible compromise might be with a pre-existing model. Um, when, we, when we did Death with Dignity, for instance, we, we went very uh, close to an existing model and that helped out in the process. So I just, I note that for what it's worth at this point. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I appreciate that, Senator Burroughs. I think part of the problem here is the opponents of the bill have not talked about improving the bill or changing it. And it's not just the Commissioner of Public Safety, by the way. It's at least 12 groups, as I understand it. Um, so thank you, Jay. Our next witness is thank you Reverend all. Mark Hughes. Mark, welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair, and good morning, committee. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you this session, Mr. Chair. Good to see you too. And yeah. the committee as well. And thank you for allowing me to come back into your committee to testify on this, which we believe is a pretty important uh, policy. Um, First, the quote of the day is, is um, I share your confusion. Um, for the record, my name is Mark Hughes. I am the executive director of uh, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and Justice for All. Um, I am also the, um, a, a minister here in, in New Alpha Missionary Baptist Church. Um, part of my testimony is gonna refer back to a previous career experience as a certified information system security professional, uh, as well as a certified information systems auditor uh, with over 25 years of experience, mostly from a risk management perspective uh, in an emerging industry, something that was new, that involved various perspectives of risk management, including accept, transfer, and mitigate. So thank you uh, for, for having me. And I also want to thank you um, for all of the work that you're doing in this area. This, uh, I believe, is a very small step uh, in the right direction. Uh, and it's also a part of, um, it's a, a portion of a multifaceted uh, challenge that we have uh, that's uh, enormous. And I think you spoke to it. Um, in conjunction with your other body uh, last year, when you resolved that the legislative body commits to a sustained and deep work of eradicating systemic racism throughout the state, uh, actively fighting racist practices and participating in the creation of more just and equitable systems. Uh, you further stated that, uh, that this legislative body uh, commits to coordinating work and participating in ongoing action grounded in science and data to eliminate race-based health disparities and, and eradicate systemic racism. <clears throat> that is uh, your R113, which uh, is the um, joint resolution relating to racism as a public health emergency that you passed last year. Uh, there was a, a number of other things. In fact, um, Mr. Chair, the first time that we met was almost around um, this time, maybe about a couple, few more weeks into the session. And I think everyone was in this committee except for our esteemed, uh, your esteemed college, uh, Senator, colleague rather, Senator Phil Bay Ruth, but I think everyone else was here and it was in the, uh, fall, the spring of uh, 2017 when uh, then uh, Senator White saved the day for us with S116 and came back with some, some phenomenal input uh, that would take us to the racial disparities in the uh, criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel. Um, and that panel is still in existence today. And that was the first work uh, of the substantial work of the legislative body towards systemic racism. And um, that um, 
panel is still in existence. Uh, we would go on to senators, uh, uh, the senators uh, committee in, in the following year with Act 9 uh, to a 2018 special session and create the racial equity executive directors panel, um, director and panel rather, uh, who by the way was charged with eradicating systemic racism. Um, we also know um, just recently, and thank you, the uh, PR2 was recently passed the constitutional amendment to abolish slavery, which really serves as a foundation in eradicating systemic racism. Also last year, we passed the health equity bill as, uh, and we just mentioned the um, R113. The reason why Mr. Chair that I went through all of those is just to, just to expand upon the breadth and the depth of the challenge that we're dealing with. Yes, we are dealing with the criminal justice system, but we also know that there is housing, education, employment, health services, access, the transportation system, economic development, as well as this system that we call uh, criminal justice. And right now we only happen to be talking about policing. Um, so this is, this is a very broad uh, challenge that we're dealing with. Um, I think we have made some uh, progress. I do think that this policy is going in the right direction. Um, I think that um, as we review it, uh, that we have to also frame it uh, in the same uh, frame that we've used to outline the challenge, the larger challenges. Um, very little am I hearing, and admittedly, I haven't been listening to this conversation very long, but I felt we would be remiss in not chiming in on this because of its importance. But very uh, little have I heard uh, that has been, that has, um, frame this conversation from in a conversation of addressing systemic racism, the responsibility that we have. We know uh, that, the, um, that the, the criminal justice system and specifically in this case, policing has a huge impact and adverse impact on essentially uh, all categories that are, that are not white, male, cis uh, and straight uh, that we know that, but you know, what we're here to talk about about this is the impact on on black and brown folks and we've we've done we've done a lot of this work uh and we continue to do so um but moving towards the policy i would just say that um the other components of of, of what we're dealing with here that must be taken into consideration um you know we, we have to take a close look at you know what is you know what to you know what does it mean when we start talking about um contracts? What does it mean when we start talking about oversight? What does it mean when we start talking about data collection, policy, training? Um, there are a whole lot of elements that go into this conversation that we're having. And I, I, don't, I don't think we're, we would do it justice if we weren't considering all of them as they come together. This is a good approach. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that uh, we should be taking a look at. Uh, however, um, when we start to talk about uh, risk management, I would like to have a conversation about the risk risk management as it pertains to black folks uh, and black, black and brown folks. And I, I, I appreciate Senator Beirut's comments earlier uh, when he was talking about risk and he kind of flipped the table on the conversation about risk because uh, that's what really what we're here for is, is, is to talk about risk as it pertains to me. Personally, I feel, and I know there are many people who look like me who feel the same way, that the, big, the biggest risk to my life um, or my safety is law enforcement in the state of Vermont, hard stop. So I, the, in all likelihood, if I am hurt or injured in the state of Vermont, unless I do it myself, um, there's a high probability that that will be at the hands of law enforcement, period. And, and it's not a new, it's not a, a, a new thing. This is a post reconstruction. This is a 1619. This is a national history thing. You've acknowledged it already in your commitment to address systemic racism. So I'd like to keep the main thing, the main thing. And that is to just have a brief conversation about what that means to us. Now, risk management, what does that mean? How do we accept risk? How do we transfer risk in our communities as black and brown folks as it pertains to policing or the rest of the criminal justice system? How do we mitigate risk? You know, and again, and I'll go back to my first visit here, Mr. Chair, when I first got here, you recall we were sitting down and we were talking about Title 20, 2366 and 2358. What are these? Uh, for those who are watching, fair and impartial policing policy, race data collection and training. 
for all law enforcement agencies. How do we even hold them accountable to that? How do we invoke Rule 25 in the House and say we actually have a viable oversight of law enforcement? One that holds them accountable, not just on a personal, personal level, but on an agency level. And we'll talk about the agency level in a minute because I think it's very important, even though we're talking about qualified immunity, to talk about the agency's responsibility because this is not a, this is a bad apple thing. Oh, that was a bad cop thing. This is a systemic thing. Again, you've already acknowledged that. This is a systemic thing and this has everything to do with how an agency is run and the culture of that agency as well. And that, and that goes back to holding that agency accountable. So how do we acknowledge, uh, how, uh, how do we accept, how do we transfer, how do we mitigate? Um, I think that in terms of how black folks engage the criminal and the civil uh, justice system today is very, very important. Um, we, we have this thing called the 14th Amendment and there's this alleged um, equal protection under the law. But if that was true, we wouldn't be having this conversation about systemic racism. And I can give you case and case and case after case where black and brown folks have sought justice, both criminally and civilly, and have failed because the system has failed them. So I think that, you know, when if, if all things are equal and we're talking about in, uh, engaging this policy and implementing this policy, I think it's fair to say that black and brown folks, even uh, with the eradication of this of this thing called uh, uh, oh, I just lost my train of thought. There. Qualified immunity. Qualified immunity. Thank you. Even um, it's neurological and being treated. But even with this qualified immunity eradication, the all that the, that we still wouldn't have um, a level playing field that we'd be playing on. I mean, it's important to acknowledge that because when. If you if we are, if we do acknowledge that, then we accept the fact that there are going to be substantial hurdles. Now, I'm not I'm not arguing against this policy. I'm just asking this all to be practical about what it actually means and what it's really going to do, because there are substantial economic um, economic hurdles that black and brown folks would need to face. Um, as I'm nearing towards conclusion, I would just say that. To read into the record, the definition of systemic racism at this point, I think is appropriate, if I can be allowed, Mr. Chair. This, this, is, this, is, the, this is the definition of systemic racism. This is the thing that, that the legislature has committed to eradicating and the executive director of, of racial equity is actually signed up to do. Systemic racism involves both the deep structures and the surface structures of racial oppression. It includes the complex array of anti-Black practices, the unjustly gained political economic power of whites, the continuing economic and other resource of inequalities along racial lines, and the emotion-laden racist framing created by whites to maintain and rationalize their white privilege and power. It goes on to say that, systemic racism thus encompasses the dominant white racial frame with its white racist attitudes, ideologies, emotions, images, and narratives, as well as the discriminatory actions and institutions flowing out of and linked to that frame. This racism is material, social, ideological rea uh, reality, and indeed systemic, which means that the racist reality is manifested in all major institutions. And I quote you from, um, this is a quote from uh, a book that we've used for years in doing our work. It's called Racist America, Roots, Current Realities and Future Reparations, Joe Fagan and Kimberly Ducey. I say that to say this is, is that this, this is a systemic issue that we're dealing with. Qualified immunity and lifting it, yes, it will move the needle some to the policy. One of the things that's really important to understand in this as we do our work in, in bolstering the HRC, as we do our work in bolstering the Attorney General's office's abilities to respond to criminal and civil uh, and deliver consistently equal protection under the law. Um, as, we, as we do the same thing in, in our, our, our state's attorney's offices, understanding uh, that um, it's really important that we are balancing how we how we mitigate uh, or how we um, 
manage rather risk. Um, it's, I think as we do all of this work, I think it's also important that we hold agencies accountable. And I think, and I heard a, a golden nugget earlier today in testimony is, is as we connect things to insurance, for example, uh, when you if, you, if you go back and take a look at the policy right now, as it's before you, I think it's over on page uh, three, two, three, authority. I've got a mess here. Page three of three. Um, there's a there there is a provision notwithstanding the provisions. Um, and oh, by the way, we are a proponent of this policy, and we are very open uh, to uh, working you know working in this process to make this policy better. So contrary to all of the other assertions, there there's a willingness in our communities to work with folks who oppose this policy. To be clear. Um, we support the ACLU, we, we're behind this, but if, if there's some better ideas, somebody for, for crying out loud, say something. But one of the thing here is, um, in notwithstanding the provisions of Title Three and Chapter 29, uh, uh, 189 and Titles uh, 2955, it says uh, law enforcement shall indemnify law enforcement officers for any liability incurred, and it goes on, it talks about liability from the perspective of law enforcement. So all this policy is really all about, at the end of the day, um, after all of the money is pushed back and forth across the table, um, how, you know, how, how safe uh, is the establishment, is the municipality, how safe is the state, um, and, and how safe is the law enforcement officer, and who's out of money, okay? And at the end of the day, that doesn't do anything for black and brown bodies for us, because with, with systemic racism still in place, we still, again, face numerous obstacles. We, I believe that somewhere in here, if we're able to be able to tie some kind of mitigation commitments into these agencies, you, you might have some better policy. I think if, particularly as it pertains to insurability, and you can do that. Now, back to um, the experience that I've had as a systems auditor, as a security professional, when it was very new to hold a person accountable for protecting data or sens sensitive information or organizations, when insurance companies first started uh, engaging in this type of activity, yeah, it wasn't a whole lot of information out there, unlike what we're dealing with now, because there's reams and volumes of information out there right now about how folks have had use of force against them, where it's up over 31, 32% here in Burlington, up from 17% four years ago. Uh, where there's claims and complaints and deaths all across the state. Don't say we don't have information, Mr. Chair. But previously, when I was in another industry, yes, the industry was immature. Yes, there were, they were still trying to figure things out. There was a tectonic shift that was happening across the nation at that time, and folks had to get on the train. And at some point or another, what we were able to do is we were able to move to a point to a maturity where we are today. They held organizations accountable. They insurance companies came in and said, you know, are, do you have, do you have policies in place? Do you have training in place? Do you have, you know, are, are you surveying your systems? Are you auditing your systems on a regular basis and so on and so forth? That comports very easily to the conversation that we're having right now in terms of title uh, 20, 2366 and 2358, the requirements that we have for law enforcement agencies, all 79 of them collect data implement fair and, fair and impartial policing policy and conduct training in 2358, why would we not tie that to the requirements to be able to make these agencies eligible to have the, um, the insurance that they need in order to cover these, these law enforcement officers? Um, so there are some ideas, I think, that could be fleshed out here. But at the end of the day, to move this forward, I think the key is, is to hold agencies accountable so they can hold individuals accountable. And as an insurance company, if I was going to insure you and you told me, no, I'm just going to put my other hand on, I've got fair and partial policing policy in place, check, I'm collecting data, here, here it all is, and it's not on a freaking bunch of spreadsheets over at the crime research group stacked in a pile, uh, most of them not legible, uh, but, it's, but it, it's something that is useful, um, check, uh, yeah, here's the training records of all my, check, well, that's going to reduce the, the, uh, the risk or, or the um, exposure, if you will, for that particular agency in a perfect world. And I think we can build from that. 
Uh, but I think we got to get constructive with this type of work that we're doing here and link it to the other work that we've already done, the work that we established, us established the, the, the groundwork for years ago. So um, I thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for your time. And I, I, I would say, um, just as an alibi fire, um, some of the other things that is really, really important to be thinking about now as we talk about transferring risk or mitigating risk is also what are we doing in our communities, in our impacted communities? Because that what that does is that also takes the pressure off of, of this age old, uh, this age old, all the way back from slave catching, this age old dance that black and brown folks do with policing. So what we tried to do here in Burlington was is to divest and reinvest some of those resources into you know, what is now the Richard Kemp Center to be able to stand up, you know, uh, outreach and education and adult basic education and youth activity, youth activities and workforce development and all of those rich resources that must be in these communities to be able to divest again and reinvest in these. All you heard about in the news was a 30 percent reduction in law enforcement officers, which really goes back to what folks choose to look at and what they choose to focus on. Nobody wants to talk about divesting and reinvesting in the commitment that we need to make in these communities if we're going to make some progress in these areas. If we're really trying, if we're really trying to reduce the risk to those who are exposed in our community, as opposed to just having a conversation to making sure that the police come out whole. Of course, everybody wants good policing in their communities if it keeps them safe. We shouldn't have to have that conversation. But we also want to invest in these communities that we know are vulnerable. That's how we mitigate. That's how we transfer risk. That's how we make the investment that needs to be invested. So thank you for your time. I'm going to your questions. Uh, again, appreciating the opportunity to come and talk to you. I know you're moving towards a markup. Uh, and if, if, there's, um, you know, if there's anything that, that uh, you'd want to come back and get any questions answered for me later on, you can also reach out later. Appreciate that, Mark, very much. Are there any questions for Mark? at this point. I think you were pretty thorough and I appreciate the testimony. Uh, committee, we're going to go on a break. Oh, Senator White, you had a question or comment? Thank you. I just wanted to thank Mark because as usual, you are um, pretty clear in your opinion. So thank you very much. <laughs> Senator White, it's good to see you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, committee, we're going to go on a break until five after 11. <laughs>